Hello, good people. It's nice to be back here on your Joy Learning Channel. This is the revision show. We are about to have a wonderful mathematics experience. And today, I will be joining you on that journey. Indeed, I will have the pleasure and privilege of helping you navigate your path as we go revising that wonderful topic, plain geometry. My name is Danzo. Tonight, we are going to explore our world. Plain geometry, what is it all about? Well, stay tuned. Before this show ends, I hope that you would have learned a few things. For example, you should be able to determine the value and properties of angles under different scenarios. The types and the properties of angles, whatever scenario they may be. I hope that before this class ends, you should be able to describe the symmetry or otherwise of any plane figure. Hopefully, before this class ends, you should be able to determine the value and properties of the lens and angles of some plane figures. You know, there are lots of them. We'll consider only a few of them today. And you should be able to identify different plane shapes by their geometric properties. Once again, you are welcome to the revision show, and I am your guide, Danso. What are plane figures or what is plane geometry? Let's begin by defining key concepts. What is a plane? A plane is a two dimensional surface that extends infinitely. Now, think about it this way if you are watching me tonight, I believe that your feet are on the ground, except you are in bed, of course. Well, whatever be the case, there is a ground. And what that means is that it is on a flat surface. Well, even if it's undulating, what it means is that you have a surface nevertheless. You have a wall, or maybe walls. Those walls are a finite description of something much more infinite. So the floor stretches out on all directions. So that is your horizontal plane. If you have an exercise book by your side, anywhere to raise it, that would be a plane. The one upright being the vertical plane and the one lying down being the horizontal plane. It stretches infinitely. It means endlessly. That is a plane. So what is geometry or what is plane geometry? Geometry is that branch of mathematics concerned about the properties of space and all the related distances and shapes and sizes and relative positions of figures or points. Now, the word geometry actually comes from two different words. Geo, meaning the earth, and metron, meaning measurement. So geometry actually implies measurement of the earth. Why the earth? Because the earth is roughly spherical. So we measure the earth. Plain geometry helps us to measure the earth on an infinitely stretching surface. So tonight, especially for my seniors, those of you in your final year, especially those of you preparing for your final exams, I would encourage you to take particular note of this topic. Reason? Well, often it's quite ubiquitous. You find it everywhere. Multiple choice questions, compulsory questions, optional questions, everywhere. Besides, it sneaks into other topics like coordinate geometry, like mensuration, um, sometimes even calculus. So, it would be great to pay attention to it. It is like foundational to lots of other topics. 
And so I would encourage you to listen with some rapt attention. Put away any device or company that would interfere with your studying tonight. I would encourage you to have a notebook, a pen or a pencil, and take notes as we go along. So, let's go on. Geometry deals with two dimensions, two dimensions, and three-dimensional figures. Well, for tonight, we'll be dealing with two-dimensional figures. When it is dealing with two-dimensional figures, it means it is concerned only with the length, that is, the longer side, and the width or the breadth, how wide it is. Three dimensions or 3D will be concerned with the length, the breadth, and in addition, the depth. Some people prefer to call it the height, but it is much more, well, in my personal opinion, better to call it depth because anything that is three dimensional can be felt. So anything you can feel is three dimensional, it has depth. All right, so tonight we'll be exploring some of the basic concepts and I will be taking deliberate pauses at some point to emphasize certain things. In the course of the show, I would help you solve a few problems so you have an idea how to go about it, especially if you're a senior and you are about to write your final exams. So let's define what an angle is because it is a key concept you would encounter in plane geometry. What is an angle? An angle by simple definition is the turning about a fixed point. The turning about a fixed point. Let me illustrate it. So you have an elbow, like my elbow here. My elbow is a fixed point. Now my lower arm and my upper arm are what in mathematics we will call the ray, or better still, the line or line segment. If I turn, that shape created is called an angle. So it is a turning about a fixed point, my elbow. That is an angle. So an angle is a turning about a fixed point. A turning about a fixed point. So the fixed point provides the axis of rotation, while the angle so formed will be described about the lines or the rays of rotation. You got that right. So, an angle is formed when two rays or more meet at a fixed point. We call that fixed point by different names, including the fixed point, the vertex. All right. So, how do we categorize angles? Well, you may not find this a standard, but it is my way of helping you understand it. Let me categorize them for you. So, we can categorize angles based on their meeting point or meeting place. We can categorize angles based on their size or by their magnitude, how big or how small they are. We can also categorize angles based on their relationship with other angles. Let's begin by categorizing angles based on their meeting point or meeting place. So, you have heard of angles that meet at a point in space. Well, from your early days with mathematics, you may have met this quite often. Yeah, so we say angles that meet at a point in space sum up to 360 degrees. That is the sexagesimal system. Simply put, base 60 way of measuring things. All right. And they form a circle. In other words, angles that meet at a point would form a circle. And the circle must give you angles that sum up to 360 degrees. In radian measure, that would be 2 pi. All right. Angles that meet at a point on a straight line. I would make an emphasis on this very shortly. Angles that meet at a point on a straight line. These angles would always sum up to 180 degrees or half a circle. 
in radian measure, that will be pi radian. Unlike the full circle, that will be 2 pi radian, the angles that meet at a point on a straight line will sum up to 180 degrees or pi radian if we are choosing to measure it in radian measure. All right, let's move away from there. And I hope you're taking notes. We have categorized angles based on their meeting point or meeting place. And we said that those kind of angles, there are two primarily, angles that meet at a point, sum up to 360 degrees from a circle, angles that meet at a point on a straight line from half a circle, sum up to 180 degrees. What about the angles that meet at a point in space? How do they really meet? So imagine that point. It's a point in space, really space. Remember, we talked about a plane. A plane being an infinitely stretched out two-dimensional figure. So let's say we have a ray in green there. That's a ray. If we have another ray, an angle is formed. Actually, two angles are formed. All right. But more angles can be formed. And if we were to put all this together, we would have 360 degrees. That is how the angles are formed in space. The angles that meet at a point on a straight line would would be different. And um, just give me a second, I'll take you to that. We have angles that meet All right, so angles that meet at a point on a straight line. And folks, I need you to pay attention to this. When angles meet at a point on a straight line, I have often heard students say that the angles, that the angles meet, uh, I mean, are on a straight line. Now, Angles on a straight line by themselves will not add up to 180 degrees. Please take note. The angles must meet at a point on the straight line. Now, let's categorize angles based on their sizes, their magnitude, how big or small they are. If an angle is greater than 0 degrees but less than 90 degrees, we say that the angle is acute. The word acute is of an origin meaning sharp, more like needle. So an acute angle is sharp, very sharp. It is less than 90 degrees, very, very sharp. All right, there are other angles that are bigger than the acute angle. So the obtuse angle, well, it has a meaning I'm not too comfortable talking about, but maybe we should call it blunt. So an obtuse angle is greater than an acute angle. It is more than 90 degrees, but it is less than half a circle. It's less than 180 degrees. Then we have a reflex angle. The word reflex means to bend backwards. To bend backwards. A reflex angle is greater than 180 degrees, but it is less than 360 degrees. That is a reflex angle. So we have categorized angles based on a number of things. Now let's solve a problem. This is a question from 2017. The West African Secondary School Certificate Exams 2017, question 20. That was a multiple choice question. And the question says, I read, in the diagram, XY is a straight line. Angle POX equals angle POQ and angle ROY equals angle QOR. So, the premise is done. The demand of the question, find the value of angle POQ plus angle ROY. 
and the options are given a 60 degrees b 90 degrees c 100 degrees and d 120 degrees let's take the question a little slower in the diagram x y is a straight line angle p o x so look at p o x it is on the leftmost side the question says it is equal to angle p o q which is next to it if we are moving clockwise from x not our typical positive x but this x just by the description of the question so those two angles are equal and you can see the marks there showing that they are equal well it says further on that angle roy which is farthest right is equal to angle qor which is second coming anti-clockwise all right you notice something and this is my emphasis my emphasis here is note that at point o there is a fixed point the lines meet at a fixed point if the lines were meeting differently they would not necessarily add up to 180 degrees so let's solve the problem and let's see how this works out the solution to this problem it says since angle pox is equal to angle poq since that is true based on the question's information then let's make one of those angles pox and poq let's make it x so we have defined or declared a variable x and since roy equals qoy again from the question then let's declare another variable let's call those two equal angles by a different name from the first two let's call it y so pox is x poq is x because they are alike and roy is different from pox so we call it y and qor is also different from pox but it is alike as or similar or the same as roy we call it y so we have declared our variables so what do we do we remember an important property which says that if we add all the angles that meet at a point on a straight line they must add up to half a circle you recall that they must give us 180 degrees so angle pox plus poq plus roy plus qor must give us 180 degrees well so what do we do with that we state why we have written that we say because they are angles that meet at a point on a straight line you are used to saying angles that meet at a point or angles on a straight line it's not just angles on a straight line they are angles that meet they must meet at a point on a straight line so we have our x and y what do we do we simply say x plus x plus y plus y must give us 180 degrees because the first two were x the last two were y so x plus x plus y plus y must give us 180 degrees well so to put them together x plus x 2x y plus y 2y in other words 2x plus 2y must be equal to 180 degrees and if we factored 2 out we would have what you have on your screen 2 in parenthesis x plus y equals to 180 degrees so x plus y must be 90 degrees what do we do with this we recall that angle p o x p o q i beg your pardon was denoted as x and angle r o y was denoted as y and we were demanded from the question to do something to find the value of p o x plus r o y and we have done that so x plus y which is p o x p 
POQ plus angle ROI must be 90 degrees. So, well, we are done. Our answer is 90 degrees, and of course, it would have been B as our final answer. Now, let's continue with types of angles. So, we spoke about acute angle, and this is what it will look like. Quite smallish, because it is sharp, and our obtuse angle, which will be a lot bigger. So, look at my arm one more time. I have an acute angle, quite small. By opening it up, I have an obtuse angle. So, acute, quite small. If I stretch it out, I have an obtuse angle. Well, the reflex angle, I can still use my arm. And this time around, although I'll have it as an acute angle this way, the angle around, remember, reflex means bending backwards. So the angle around my elbow, not inside of my arm, but outside, will be the reflex angle. So you have a picture on your screen there. The reflex angle must be greater than 180 degrees, but less than 360 degrees. So the angle bends backwards, not inward anymore, backwards. That's a reflex angle. So let's move on now. We have described angles based on where we can find them, whether in space or on the straight line, meeting at a point. Else, we have described them by their sizes. So we say we have acute, obtuse, reflex. Now, let's define angles based on their relationship with other angles. So we have complementary angles, and this, these angles are critical, especially when you get into trigonometry. Complementary angles are angles that add up to 90 degrees. In other words, 30 degrees and 60 degrees are complementary. 45 degrees and 45 degrees are complementary. One degree and, yes, can I hear you? Correct. 89 degrees give us complementary angles because one plus 89 will give us 90 degrees. Zero degrees plus 90 degrees will give us 90 degrees. So zero and 90 degrees are complementary. 40 degrees and 50 degrees are complementary. They sum up to 90 degrees. I, I guess this is quite clear. All right, we have supplementary angles. Well, supplementary angles add up to 180 degrees. So 100 degrees plus 80 degrees will give us 180. So 100 degrees and 80 degrees are supplementary. 90 degrees and 90 degrees give us 180 degrees. They are supplementary. 130 degrees and 50 degrees add up to 180 degrees, 130 degrees and 50 degrees are supplementary. You get that, I believe. We'll be using supplementary angles very shortly. All right, we have consecutive interior angles. You know it more popularly by the name co-interior angles. They are called consecutive interior angles. They sum up to 180. In other words, they are supplementary. Or consecutive interior angles add up to 180 degrees. We have vertically opposite angles. Vertically opposite angles are equal. They are equal. All right, and we have alternate angles. Alternate angles are angles that are equal to each other. The word alternate means on the other side of. So if you ever saw a lady or some model doing a catwalk, they are walking and their steps are alternating. That is alternating angles. I'll give you a preview of this very shortly. And finally, we have corresponding angles. They are also equal one to the other. Let's take a look at this. Let's talk about parallel lines because we are speaking about angles based on their relationship with other angles. What is a parallel line? A parallel line or lines are lines that are equidistant one from the other along their entire length. Let me explain that. If we have two lines, say line AB, and we have another line, line RS. These two lines are parallel for only one reason. One reason primarily. The reason being that 
the distance from A to R is the same as the distance from B to S vertically and entirely across the stretch. So their distances apart must consistently, continuously, infinitely remain the same. If it changes at any point, for example, if the distance from AR is say 5 centimeters and it becomes 4.9999 at DS, it no longer qualifies as a parallel line or set of parallel lines. So these lines must always have the same distance throughout the entire length, their entire length. Those are parallel lines. Yes, I have heard people define it as lines that never meet. Well, that is only as a consequence. Because their distances are always the same between them, then they would never meet. So they are right in that sense. Well, when we have two parallel lines by themselves, there is really nothing happening. But the moment something else is introduced, we have a situation in our hand. When a transversal is introduced, then a number of things happen. A line that cuts two or more parallel lines is called the transversal. It transverses, it goes across them. Now, this transversal creates something. It creates at least eight angles whenever this happens. So, on your screen, you see eight angles. A transversal will create a minimum of eight angles for any pair or set of parallel lines. Now, I have color coded them so that you can follow. Now, watch this. Notice the number one. It is like repeated in number five. They are coded orange. The number two and number six are color coded red. It's because they are alike. Now, I want you to think about it for a moment. And if you want to note it, please do. Well, I will be repeating it so if you lost it at any point, you would follow. So a transversal, remember, will create a minimum of eight angles across a pair or a set of parallel lines. If there are three parallel lines, well, then the number of angles will become 24. Because, I mean, sorry, not 24, they will become 12 because at every point, four will be created. All right, so let's look at those parallel lines and see the relationship between the angles. Line AB is parallel to line RS. Line AB is parallel to line RS. That is a given. All right, what else? Angle 1 is equal to angle 5. Why? You will find out. You would also observe that angle 2 is equal to angle 6. Why are they equal? Think about it this way. Do you live on a story building or close to one? Well, maybe the time of day would not permit you to go outside, but by morning, or if you could look through your window, you would observe something interesting. And this is where plane geometry becomes really fun because it becomes practical. You would observe that if there were three floors, all the windows from the third floor to the ground floor will line up. So the same location for the window on the third floor will be the same location for the window on the second floor, on the first floor, on the ground floor. Well, so we notice that three, angle three is the same thing as angle seven, and angle four is the same as angle eight. Why? Because all those angles correspond one with the other. So these angles are called corresponding angles. So one corresponds to five, two corresponds to six, three and four correspond to seven and eight respectively. 
to those are corresponding angles. There are more. Look at this. We have our parallel lines still. We have our eight angles. But you would observe that angle 3 plus angle 5 must sum up to 180. Do you remember that property? Okay, why is it so? Well, I will let you think about it. Angle 4 and angle 6, when added, must also give us 180. Why? I want you to try it. Why is it so? Well, because they are co-interior angles. Notice that 3 and 5 are on the same side of the transversal. 4, 6. Angle 4 and angle 6 are on the right side of the transversal. But they are inside. They are consecutively in the interior. Those two angles, 4 and 6, must sum up to 180 degrees. 3 and 5, because they are on the same side, they are consecutively in between the parallel lines. They also must add up to 180 degrees. Those are co-interior angles. Recall that the angles are co-interior only because they have above and beneath them parallel lines. All right. Angle 3 is equal to angle 6. Angle 3 is equal to angle 6. Why so? Well, let's look at the, its partner. Angle 4 must also be equal to angle 5. Remember, alternating angles, they are alternating. So you notice 3 and 6 are on the different sides of the transversal. 3 is on the left, 6 is on the right, but both of them are within the parallel lines. On the other hand, 4 and 5 are also on different sides of the transversal, but they are all within the parallel lines. They are alternating angles, and they are equal all the time. All right. Let's finish up on this. Angle 1 is equal to angle 4. Why? Look carefully. They are vertically opposite. Diagonally, they face each other. In the same way, 2 faces 3. So it is vertically opposite. And 5 faces 8, just the same way 6 faces 7. They are vertically opposite angles. Now, let me take a pause here and draw your attention to something very important. If you look at your screen once again, you would notice that our parallel lines A and B and R and S have something very little at the end. In some drawings, those little things at the end could be at the middle. I refer to the point B and point S. You will notice there are arrowheads. Now, in mathematics, we use little symbols to denote things. Those arrows signify that the lines A, B, and R, S are parallel. Please, in the absence of either a clear statement, a clear, unambiguous statement saying that line AB and line RS are parallel, or like what you have in pink on your screen, that notation in pink saying parallel, where you have two lines between the alphabets AB and RS, in the absence of such a notation, please do not consider any two straight lines parallel only because they look so. It must be clearly stated in words that line AB is parallel to line RS, or by mathematical notation, we say AB, then we put two lines in between, meaning parallel to RS. Unless that is stated, or there are arrowheads, either at the end, at the beginning, in the middle, wherever, so long as there are arrowheads, unless one of these three things occur, Please do not assume, for whatever reason, that the lines are parallel. Don't make that assumption. Seniors especially, I need to caution you. There is a temptation to consider every 
two lines as parallel because they appear so in your mind. Please know, a math will be very specific, it will tell you in clear words. Indeed, if it's a standardized exam, not only will the words be clearly stated, the symbols would also be written. Well, there is only one instance where these will not happen. It will mean by implication. So you would observe that we will give you a shape and you will be required to deduce from that shape that certain lines are parallel. Let me explain that a bit. If you are Guinean and um, your name is, say, Angela, or your name is Coco, or your name is Ethia, we would have to Im immediately and reasonably imply that you're female. To be Ghanaian and to be called Coco or Ethia or Angela and be male will be a bit out of the ordinary. So there are some questions where you would not be told that certain lines are parallel, but by the very fact of the question and the shape, you ought to know that it is or they are parallel lines. I'll come to some of those conditions very, very shortly. So please, seniors and every other person watching, I need you to take particular note of these. All right, let's talk about plain figures. Plain figures. Recall we have dealt with angles, and so far we dealt with different types of angles. Angles based on where they meet, angles based on their sizes, angles based on their relationship one with another. Now, what are plane figures? We have different types of plane figures. We have triangles. We have the equilateral triangle, the isosceles triangle. We have the scalene triangle. Right. These are one category of plane figures. A plane figure is simply any figure that is bounded. That is bounded. Triangles are bounded by three line segments. Triangles are bounded by three line segments. And these are some of the examples. We'll go for a break very shortly. I need you to note these because when we come back, we'll be exploring the world of plane figures in plane geometry. I'll see you after the break. Yo, hello, you're back, and I am back. Welcome back. Well, before the break, we had considered a number of things. We had considered what a plane is, what plane geometry is. We considered angles and different ways by which we can categorize angles and the types of angles we have in those different categories. Well, this show is also on your social media handles. On Twitter, you can find us at Joy Learning TV. On Instagram, you can find us at Joy underscore Learning TV. And please do not forget to visit the YouTube channel on Joy Learning TV. Subscribe, like that channel, and please share with your friends, family, and every other person you care about. Before the break, we were dealing with plain figures, and we began with the very first triangles. We had the equilateral triangle isosceles triangle and the scalene. Well, let me add one more for you. It's the right or the right angled triangle. We shall explore each of these triangles because they are the first of our plane figures. The first of the plane figures. Recall that I said at the beginning that this is important. It's important to understand plane geometry because it sneaks into other topics. So for example, 
when you get into mensuration, you'll find there's plane geometry practically everywhere. Indeed, when you get into things like cycle theory, you'll find a lot of plane geometry. Indeed, a cycle is a plane figure, and so it conforms to the, what do you call it, the rules of plane geometry. So, let's get into the triangles. Let's talk about the equilateral triangle. Why is it called an equilateral triangle? It is called equilateral triangle because there are equal laterals. So, the equilateral triangle is a triangle that has equal sides. All three sides are equal. It is equilateral, equal lines. And we would denote the equality of the lines by those lines you see striking line PQ, PR, and SR. So it's equilateral. Three sides are equal. That's one of its properties. Secondly, all of its angles are equal in magnitude. It has three angles because it's a triangle. All three sides are equal. And those angles must add up. Each of them should be 60 degrees because angles in a triangle, sum of them, the sum of the angles in a triangle must add up to 180 degrees. Hence, if they are all equal, 180 degrees divided by 3 should be 60 degrees. Now, I need to take a pause here and draw your attention to this. There are times a question is given to you, and again here I speak to my final year students. Please, we do not always present you with the angle 60 written in an equilateral triangle. Those marks on the triangle are indications. They imply that the angles must be 60 degrees. We would not say to you in the same way when you hear a name, you're Ghanaian, and you hear the name Koko, or you hear the name Ekia, or you hear the name Angela, we do not have to tell you that that is a female. If you're Ghanaian, you should know that name belongs to a female, unless you're not Ghanaian, or maybe you're Ghanaian, but you decided to go your way. All right. So the angles... In a triangle, an equilateral triangle, each of them must be 60 degrees. What else? The perpendicular bisector of an equilateral triangle would do something. The perpendicular bisector is that line you see from P running down to S. It's green broken. It is called perpendicular because it will form a 90 degree. And if it forms a 90 degree on one side, Obviously, on the other side, there must be another 90 degrees. That line is going to bisect two things. The word bisect means it's going to cut into two equal halves. What is it going to bisect? It's going to bisect the apex angle, where the apex angle in this particular case will be the angle at P. It will divide that angle. So one of it will be 30 and the other will be 30. It would also bisect the line QR so that that line will have two equal parts. The line is QR, and so when it is divided, you will have 0.5 QR on both sides. So that is an equilateral triangle. All sides are equal, all angles are equal. The perpendicular bisector would divide the apex angle and the base in two. All right, the isosceles triangle. Isosceles. The word isosceles is from two words. Isos, meaning equal, and skeles, meaning legs. So an isosceles triangle is a triangle that has equal legs. <laughs> More like skeleton, but that's not where it comes from anyway. So the isosceles triangle could look like this, but it is not isosceles yet. It only becomes so when two sides are of equal length. In other words, xy must be equal to xz, but yz will be unlike any of them. So those two marks you see on xy and xz shows that the triangle is isosceles. 
because those two marks are not shown on YZ, it means that the length YZ is different from the other lengths XY and XZ. What are the other properties of an isosceles triangle? Well, the two base angles have equal magnitude. Now, I have put the base in red because I intend to draw your attention. Not just two angles are equal, it is two base angles that are equal. The angles that are equal must be the base angle. In other words, if you were to trace with, say, your finger along the equal lines, where the lines separate to endpoints, those angles will be the base angle. For example, say the apex or the apex angle was point it was y. Our base angles would not have been y and z. If we traced from y with our fingers, the base angles would have occurred at x and z. If our apex was z so that our equal lines were xz and yz, then our angles would be at x and y. So for an isosceles triangle, two sides are equal and two base angles are equal. It means the third one is unlike the other two. All right. What would happen if we had a perpendicular bisector to an isosceles triangle? For an equilateral triangle, we saw that apex angle and base length are bisected. What happens with the isosceles triangle? Very much the same thing. The base angles, sorry, the, the, the apex angle is divided in two and the base length is also divided in two. So it has similar characteristics as the equilateral triangle. 